Welcome to the Road to Wire NBA show. Nick Whalen here with Alex Barutha. Some of you are listening to this on Dash Radio on Wednesday, October 14th. Some of you might be listening to this on our regular podcast feed, others uh, on the Road to Wire YouTube channel. This is the first one that we're putting out uh, with the video component. Some of our NFL and MLB shows have already been doing this, uh, but we're going to expand it into to NBA as well. So, uh, Alex, we'll see how this goes. Uh, excited to be talking hoops with you again for the second day in a row now. We, we had to do somewhat of an emergency pod with James Anderson on Monday to wrap up the finals and, and talk title odds for next year. So make sure to check our podcast feed uh, or rotowire.com slash basketball if you want to listen to that. But there's a lot to talk about, even with no games going on, um, you know, even with kind of the uncertainty with how the summer is going to go, how the offseason schedule is going to shape up, uh, that the finals are over, but, you know, the, the cycle of news never really stops. Yeah, I don't know if people were on iTunes, like, clamoring, like, you know, I love listening to these guys, but I wish I could sit down at my computer and just see their right. faces. Uh, <laughs> I, I hate how convenient it is to be able to put my phone in my pocket and listen to them while I work out. I, I need to sit down and stare at them for 55 minutes. Oh, man. Yeah, the yeah, I enjoyed the podcast we did with James on Monday um, talking about just the finals. But now, yeah, now we're just talking about I mean, most of the news is revolving around either free agency or coaching uh, vacancies at this point. And there's. It's mostly the Rockets and the Pelicans are apparently fighting for like the same three people in Ty Lue, Jeff Van Gundy, and, and Jason Kidd. Right. It, it's kind of it's been hard to get a hold and and a grasp on what's real with some of these coaching searches just because of some of the limitations. Uh, you know, Jeff Van Gundy, for example, was in the NBA bubble as recently as two nights ago. So, you know, while while Ty Lue left, you know, three weeks ago now, he could he can interview for the Clippers job internally, he could interview for other jobs. Uh, Jeff Van Gundy kind of had to wait and, and maybe do things virtually. So I think that's maybe the reason that some of these uh, searches are being delayed a little bit. Um, I mean, we saw Tibbs. When, when did the Tibbs hiring take place? Was that like June, July? That seems like forever ago. I, I don't even really remember. I think around then. But... Yeah, I'll, he is the coach of the Knicks. Um, <laughs> yeah. But we it's been just such a long, you know, for some of these teams, like, like the Knicks, their offseason essentially began – in mid-March. And, you know, you do wonder if, if maybe they wish they would have waited based on some of the the other things that shook out, you know, Mike Van, or, uh, Mike D'Antoni, for example, uh, becoming available. Not that he'd want to go back to New York, but uh, things have changed. And and like you said, Ty Lue, uh, the, the reports today that he's gaining momentum for the Rockets job. Uh, and like you said, Jeff Van Gundy uh, will also interview. I, I've gotten the sense from some people that you know, I think Ty Lue is, is the guy they probably want. I think there's maybe some concerns about how much money Ty Lue would command. Um, and, and I think Jeff Van Gundy would maybe take the job for less, given that he's been out of coaching for more than a decade at this point. Um, I mean, I, you and I both love JVG as a commentator. He's kind of had a, a second life um, you know, in that role. And it, even though his name has come up for every single vacancy in the last 11 or 12 years, uh, it just hasn't really materialized. Would you have any concerns about a guy who's been out of the game for that long taking over a job if, if you're a Rockets fan? Maybe a little bit. Um, I don't know. I feel like he, he would at least be like a really interesting kind of like, I mean, he's a, he, he, he's a wild card for any team that he like would latch on to. Right. And if the Rockets, the Rockets need more of a switch up than maybe any other team in the league at this point, like they're kind of stale. Right. So mm -hmm. Jeff Van Gundy would probably help alleviate them of, of some of that. Um, and I he would presumably change the offense. I don't know. I don't like nothing really sticks out in my mind in terms of like what he thinks of the Rockets offense currently. Like I can't think of anything that he's said, which he probably has. He's about, definitely like, been critical of, of James Harden standing around, you know, that's yes, that. And so, it makes me wonder, like, if, if you were to bring him in, you know, James Harden's aware of that, obviously. I, I'm sure he's he's probably watched film of, of those games when when Van Gundy's saying things like that. Like, I, I feel like, and I don't, again, I don't, I think you're right to point out, you know, who, who knows what the style would be. I, I, I think if he, like, talking about the Houston job specifically, I think you need someone that's going to hold James Harden a little bit more accountable than, you know, than, than Mike D'Antoni certainly was willing to do. And, and they had a nice working relationship, but I think part of that was, D'Antoni willing to not get on James Harden for, you know, not moving without the ball or, or not always giving 100 percent effort on defense. I don't, I don't think you need to go hire Jim Boylan or some disciplinarian, but it, it does seem like Houston needs a little bit of a culture shift internally. 
Yeah, I think so. And I'm not sure. I I mean, I don't know if Jason Kidd or Ty Lue is really that guy either. Um, I mean, maybe Jason Kidd, after, you know, winning the title with LA, has a little more, like, I, I, don't, I don't know if clout's the right word. I don't know if he's really changed as a coach because he was horrible in Milwaukee. And I have, like, basically zero strong opinions on Ty Lue um, with what he did with the Cavaliers and LeBron. And I think hiring him would just probably be like what the most neutral thing you could do. Pretty similar to like the 76ers hiring Doc Rivers, I would say. Yeah, I, I think with Ty Lue, you know, he's, he's a championship winning coach, but there's still this sense, at least for me, that we, we don't exactly know what his coaching style is because when you coach a LeBron James team, you don't really get to always coach how you would normally. So. Right. You know, most of the time, like uh, all of LeBron's other coaches, we've now seen either before or after LeBron. You know, we've seen Eric Spolstra coach the Heat since LeBron left, and he's a great coach. We we saw Mike Brown coach before and after LeBron got there. Um, you, you know, David Blatt has obviously been successful everywhere, but when he was coaching LeBron, like other coaches have been able to prove it. And right now, Ty Lue has not really been given that opportunity yet. So I, I think there's a lot of upside, but at the same time, I, you know, I would still have some question marks, I guess. But you know, he, he's also developed a, an incredible reputation for his work as an assistant, both in Cleveland and with the Clippers now. Right. Yeah, I would just be, like, nervous to give either him or Jeff Van Gundy, like, a five-year deal. Like, I, I uh, and I guess Jason Kidd, but I'm pretty sure Jason Kidd is, like, the most committed to, like, wanting the coach for a long time, mm -hmm. I'd say, at this point, because JVG's already been out. Like, I feel like there's a concern that he would just go to the Rockets because it's easy. Because the ESPN article I read said that it's probably his preferred destination because he has kind of, it's like his adopted city. And he basically, I think he lives there in Houston. Yep. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, how often, th there are times where, I mean, it's kind of like the Phil Jackson thing, right? Where they basically like begged Phil Jackson to coach there because it was easy for him. And then he just kind of half-assed it. Yeah. I, I wouldn't worry about the half-assing necessarily. Um, but, but it's a bit of a gamble, you know, and we talk about this with most coach firings. And I think the Clippers went through the same thing with Doc Rivers. Oftentimes when you, when you're firing someone like D'Antoni or like Rivers, um, you know, only one of those guys has a title and, and Rivers, you know, got his 12 years ago now with, with a super team, but you can always do quite a bit worse. You can't always do a whole lot better. And, you know, you, you don't have like a Phil Jackson like figure, you know, we're talking like 2005 Phil Jackson to just, come in and, you know, automatically basically make everything perfect chemistry wise and, and take a team, um, you know, to that next level. There's no guarantee that that's going to happen with any of these candidates that we're really talking about. No, I don't. I mean, yeah, the Rockets, the Rockets need some sort of a change up. The Pelicans could change their entire team. So, I mean, I, I feel like I would, I mean, I think Jeff Van Gundy, I want I don't know if you make the most sense of the Pelicans, but I think if I was maybe, if I was a Pelicans fan, maybe I'd want Jeff Van Gundy just because I think he'd be really like interesting. If you were going to rebuild the team, then again, I don't know if he wants to be part of a rebuilding team, right? Like, do you hire Jeff right. Van Gundy and be like, hey, coach these young guys in your first stint back? <laughs> I mean, I, I think he's so desperate to get back into coaching that he would be <laughs> okay with that. I don't think he I don't think he conceptualizes the idea of a rebuild. Like, there's no such thing as a rebuild. He'd just be coaching young players. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, and other coaching news, Billy Donovan let go of four Chicago Bulls assistants this week. Uh, you know, not you can't really fault someone, I guess, for wanting to get his own guys in. Uh, but it's basically a complete regime change now for Chicago, uh, starting with the front office, you know, with Arturis Karnasovas taking over there. And now Billy Donovan. I'd feel pretty good about it. Again, if I was a Bulls fan, we talked about this, you know, three, four weeks ago when when the Donovan hiring happened. Uh, I, I think his stock, maybe more so than any coach in the league this year, uh, you know, rose pretty dramatically. I, I think everyone thought he was a pretty good coach, um, but then to do what he did with this Oklahoma City team that not a lot of people thought would even make the playoffs, you know, wouldn't have been surprising if they they worked a Chris Paul deal halfway through the year. And essentially, they were too good to even do that. And, and they t end up taking Houston to a game seven and, and coming out of that looking pretty good. Um, but, you know, I, I think if, if this had happened, if this all had happened like a year ago when when Billy Donovan was still like a B, B plus coach, you know, you'd be like, okay, we'll see how it goes. But I mean, the Bulls, if everyone stays healthy, if you get a full year out of Otto Porter, Wendell Carter, you know, Zach Levine continues to improve. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the Eastern Conference playoff picture in a little bit, but I think they're one of those teams that 
if you maybe look at, you know, if Indiana were to, to make some moves and take a step back, if maybe Orlando uh, finally falls out of that 7-8 spot, um, I, I think Chicago, for me, would be around the top of the list to, to fill one of those vacant playoff spots. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Because it seems like, I mean, they have enough talent on the roster, so there has to be, it feels like the big organizational change was needed for them to kind of move forward. And uh, yeah, like this this thing happens a lot, where it's like, I think the same thing happened when Budenholzer took over in Milwaukee. Um, I think he fired some other assistants that so they let them go, or however that process works. Um, so yeah, I think this is it's kind of par for the course. But again, like I think it's a good jumping off point to some extent to talk about how like, Again, like we think there's six locks in the Eastern Conference, and the Bulls could be one of those teams to, I guess, usurp the the magic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, let's let's get to that right away. Why not? You know, I, I think we had it slated for later in the episode, but might as well. Uh, we we've talked many times, including on Monday, uh, about the Western Conference, and you know, one how deep it is. Two, uh, you know, you maybe would expect OKC, assuming they do trade Chris Paul, assuming Gallinari's bat- not back, assuming maybe Stephen Adams is gone. Uh, they're they're the one team I think you could pinpoint and say, yeah, they probably fall out. So, you know, at that point, you're talking one playoff spot for five or six pretty good teams. It's not quite as severe in the Eastern Conference, but, you know, in, in a summer that's not going to have a ton of movement and not going to have, you know, like two years ago, you had the Lakers go from being one of the five worst teams in the league to all of a sudden a title contender. You know, last year, the Clippers go from the eight seed to the favorite to win the title. I don't really see that happening this year just because of the lack of big name free agents. There's not a lot of players who are in position to force an Anthony Davis like trade this off season. There's all the financial components to this. I, I just don't think it's going to be an off season of volatility roster wise. So if you assume that most of these teams come back, you know, 80 to 90% intact, I think Milwaukee, I think Toronto, I think Boston, Miami, Philly, and Brooklyn, uh, assuming your relatively decent health, are are your six playoff locks. And again, we'll see with Indiana. If, if Oladipo and, and Miles Turner change their tune and end up staying in Indiana, uh, I think that's a team that, that you could probably pencil in. I mean, they had a better record than the Miami Heat during the regular season. Um, but if, if you want to say there's like one and a half to two playoff spots open, uh, which teams that finish you know, 9 through 15 this year could you see making that leap? Washington will be interesting because of getting John Wall back, but I don't really believe in them that much. I, I don't know. Um, they, I mean, Beal is obviously really good. They're just missing a lot of other stuff. Like as much as I love Thomas Bryant, it's just, I don't think that's the, that's the piece that's going to take them over the top. And for me, I, I think it is Chicago and Atlanta are the two teams that I would kind of have my eye on in terms of, you know, what team could make a jump in like 20, 15 wins, something like that. Chicago, just because of the, I mean, we, we know what the talent is. It's Levine, um, Porter, Wendell Carter, Markinen could have a bounce back year. Um, a lot of those guys have been like delayed development due to injury and stuff like that. And like Atlanta, like they added Capella. And like we've seen before what a Rockets team has looked like with Capella as like the second or third best player. And that team was the is in the middle of the pack, wasn't the middle of the pack in the Western Conference playoff picture. And we know how talented Trey Young is. And if anyone can put Capella in good spots, and I don't know how the fit between him and John Collins is gonna work, but they have a pretty solid young core going. Like Kevin Herter keeps improving, and Cam Reddish had a good second half of this season. So I'm I'm definitely intrigued by them. Yeah, I think Atlanta is probably going to be the most trendy pick. Uh, outside of Chicago, I, I think Chicago is further along as a team right now. And I think Chicago was much more damaged from a coaching and management perspective than Atlanta was and from an injury perspective as well. Um, I, I think a lot went wrong for Chicago and they still won three more games than Atlanta did last year. And I, I guess you kind of look at like Trey Young specifically. I, I don't know like what he can necessarily do differently to impact winning outside of grow four inches and gain 40 pounds you know like he put together an an insane statistical offensive season last year that is on par with just about any second year player ever you know and it's kind of the same conversation with Dodgers where it's like if you're already this good in year two how do you project out the next three four five years he can continue to improve but like efficiency wise he was pretty damn good last year he doesn't have like a, a huge you know, off, uh, like offensive hurdle. It's not like he's a 50% free throw shooter. It's not like he turned it over six times a game. Like 
everything was pretty good there. So I kind of wonder, like, what is the big change for them? Maybe it is Capella. Maybe it's not having John Collins suspended for 25 games for steroids. Like, I I, I don't know. I, I think they, they still have some questions to answer. But I like them. I like that roster a whole lot better than Detroit. I like it a whole lot better than Cleveland. I like it better than the Knicks. Um, I mean, those are you willing? To, can we just cross those teams off already? I think so. Yeah, I mean, I have no hope for Detroit. I mean, and let, I mean, their only hope is Blake Griffin playing like all eighty-two. And that I think that's what it comes down to. The Knicks, I'm sure. I mean, I listen. I'm I'm relatively down on RJ Barrett, but he could have a really good year, and it could also not matter at all. Yeah. Uh, and Cleveland, I, Cleveland's Cleveland. So I mean, Charlotte sort of has the pieces, but they just don't. I don't know. They just don't. I don't think they have. They don't even have close to the top end talent in Chicago or Atlanta. It's not. It's right. not even a discussion. And Atlanta just kind of. I think. I think Atlanta needs more depth. Like because they're. Uh, I'm looking on cleaning the glass right now, and their most frequent lineup of Trey Young, Kevin Herter, Reddish, Hunter, and Collins was plus eleven per 100 possessions. Like their starting lineup, or what? I think that started some games at least was pretty good, but then quickly, like, their depth was horrible. Like, there, there was too much Jabari Parker. There was a lot of Damian Jones. Because their second their second most frequent lineup is minus 26. So it's like, I think I think if they shore up their depth a little bit, um, they'll be in relatively good shape. And I think they still have Deadman, maybe. Like, I don't know if he's an expiring contract or not. I, I looked that up the other day, and I honestly was like, I don't know the answer right now. I, no, I think they do, because... <laughs> So he was with them, and then he signed like that fairly big free agent deal with Sacramento, and it yeah. immediately was terrible. And I think was traded back to Atlanta, but I don't know that he ever even played because I think he was injured he did. The trade, and then the he, season shut down. But I, under, I believe he will be on the roster. He's under contract for thirteen million dollars next year and the year after. Oh. But he was good with them this year. He, well, you know, eight and eight in twenty three minutes. Yeah. I guess. Yeah, I mean, the problem is you can't he can't be your starter anymore, you know, and you're all of a sudden no. like even if, even if he's a nice backup, you probably want Capella and Collins playing 30 to 35 plus minutes each. And some of the time Collins is playing center when Capella's out. And then it's like, you know, I mean, Deadman can still be good. I guess the point I'm trying to make is you're, you're going to be paying him that money to probably play like 14 minutes a game. Right. I mean, I think I think the thing for Atlanta is they have maybe do they have the most cap flexibility in the league? Because what I'm looking at right now for 2021 or however you would say that for next season, they only have fifty nine million dollars guaranteed on the books. And the people who are not on the books are people they could easily not resign. It's Jeff Teague. It's Bembry, Vince Carter, LaVissier, Damian Jones, Trevion Graham. If those guys aren't back with the team and the cap is again like I don't even know what the cap is this year. Um, it's a hundred and something, or no, it's, I think one, it's a hundred and something. I it was like one, one Oh nine, one nineteen. I don't know. This, that, that, what I'm saying means absolutely nothing. Sure. But they, I mean, they have a lot of money to play with and I don't know. I don't know if there's really great free agents this year. Like, I don't know if they're going to be like, we need Bogdan Bogdanovich. Um, and I don't think like Gallo is going to sign there, but they have a ton of options. So I'm like, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what they do in the off season. I really think like the worst thing they could do would be to sign Gallinari to like a four year, you know, <laughs> sixty million dollar deal though, right? As as yeah. much as that would probably help them for the next two years, I don't think that would be a terrible idea. No, they need people who fit their their arc, their age arc. Right. And I, I don't think they'll force it because they're they're playing the long game. They have been this whole time. Well, I'm just thinking of like the Corey Joseph contract with the Kings last year. You know, like it felt like the Kings were kind of in the same spot, like ready to take the next step, and they just splurged Harrison Barnes, guys like that. You know, like pretty low upside, high cost type of deals. Like that's what you need to avoid. And I think it's tempting when, like you said, I'm seeing the same thing. They have the most projected cap space. I think it's kind of cool to be the big fish finally, but then of course there's nobody to sign. Yeah. But why are people not talking? We we need to start the Giannis to Atlanta uh, hype. Honestly, I mean, I know you're half kidding, but I think Atlanta is a pretty appealing market. You know, I think the team has been so blah for the last few years that it's never mentioned. But I think people, players seem to like Trey Young. They seem to appreciate his style, at least. I think John Collins is a pretty appealing guy to play with. I think Capella defensively would be pretty appealing for guards to play with. Like, 
I don't I don't think it's crazy. I, I obviously there's been no reason to think Giannis would go there, but it's not insane to think that would be a potential destination for, you know, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, guys like that who, who also could hit the market. Yeah, I mean the only I guess like the barrier for them is Trey Young. Is Trey Young ever going to give the ball up? You know, like right. how much I mean, he could play off ball theoretically, right? He's like he's such a good shooter, but it's kind of like a James Harden, Luka Doncic thing where it's like yeah. how much I guess you would want a wing, right? You would want like a Paul George type who is very comfortable being the second ball handler. Right. I, I almost think you'd want it to be somebody younger too. And that's yeah, yeah. that's harder because those guys typically don't hit free agency and have the ability to move around at that age. But yeah, I think it'd be tough for, you know, like 31 year old Paul George to start seeding touches to 22 year old Trey Young. Right. Um, so we kind of got a little sidetracked, but I, I think I, I think Atlanta and Chicago are, are those two teams. I, I disagree a little bit on Washington. I, I, I think Bradley Beal has become extremely underrated. I know the defensive metrics were it was basically him and Trey Young were the two worst defenders in the league last year. That doesn't necessarily resonate with the eye test the same way that it does when you watch Trey Young. Like with Beal, I think part of it was just like knowing who's around him and, you know, being just being on the court with like one and a half other actual NBA players most of the time. I, I think having Wall back and assuming Wall's healthy, I'm pretty optimistic about that given how much time he's missed. He, he liked Durant kind of benefits, I think, from the season, this whole timeline being pushed back. You know, he's going to have a ton of time. I think the last time he actually played in an NBA game was December of 2018. So for him, it'll be, it'll be like two plus years, you know? Yeah. And if you can't heal in that time, then, you know, that's a, maybe a bigger concern. But I, I don't think there, there, sh there should not be any worry that he's like not ready to go. You know, if, if he's not ready to go, that's on him at this point. If they get John Wall at 80 to 85% of what he was, I, I don't know. Like, I think that might be enough. Like, Brad Beal was a 30-point-per-game scorer last year. John Wall is a multi-time all-star, an all-defensive point guard at his peak. Like, I, I still think that that two-man duo is better than any two-man duo that Orlando, Charlotte, Chicago, the Knicks, Detroit, Cleveland, and maybe Atlanta. You know, I think Trey Young, John Collins probably comes close, but I, I still think Beal might be the best player out of those four. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I, my, I mean, my concern is just that their third best player might be Thomas Bryant, and it also might be Rui Hachimura. Their depth is awful. Like, and Bertans is a free agent. That's another thing that's going to be a problem yeah. for them. Like, if he stays, I can I can see them playing better. But if he's gone, it's going to be too much bonga. It's going to be a lot of Troy Brown and like Jerome Robinson. Yeah. Ish Smith is still in their contract. I'm just worried that their depth is still going to be so much of an issue that's that. True. It almost won't matter, but you're right. From a top, you know, from a top two perspective, they have a really experienced one two, and that's more experience than pretty much any of these other one twos. Um, you know, other than like Detroit's Blake Griffin and Derrick Rose. Yeah, I forgot about <laughs> Derrick Rose. This is not something I considered. I'm gonna I'm gonna need 15 to 20 minutes to process this. Uh, I, I will say with the Knicks. I, I I threw them in the the column of teams that we can cross off. What if they trade for Chris Paul? How much does that change things? Is Chris Paul is his presence alone enough to raise them over all these other teams who have you know no, none of these teams have anybody nearly as experienced or accomplished as Chris Paul? I think they would still be worse than they might still be worse than Atlanta or or uh, Chicago. Because who would they have to give up? They might have to give up like Randall. And who are yeah. they? Are they getting anybody else? So maybe, maybe I don't know. I, I think can it, RJ Barrett play off ball? He can play wherever you want. He can do, <laughs> he can do it all. <laughs> he's uh, just a hooper. Yeah, he he just plays basketball. That's a good point. I mean, Julius Randall as I, I wouldn't call him a winning player, but he's basically a twenty and ten player. And on some nights when he's at his best, can can kind of win you some games. So. Yeah, you would probably have to give him up. I, I think based on salary alone, he's the guy that you would need to to help offset a lot of that um, a lot of that money from Chris Paul. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the Knicks are definitely that team. You know, we talked about the Corey Joseph contract or throwing money at a Gallinari. Like, I could totally see them doing that. You know, if if they were to get Chris Paul, then try to overcompensate with the rest of the roster to like all of a sudden like make this a team that gets the eight seed and gets killed by Milwaukee or Boston or Miami. That. That seems very possible. Um, although it seems like Alinari, he recently said he cares more about like 
a title at this point and playing for a legitimate winning team than yeah. playing for money. So I think, you know, he's more likely to sign with like the Lakers or the Nuggets or the Mavs um, or the Clippers. Cause I think a lot, a lot of those teams have the mid-level exception. And I think for one year, that's up to like nine and a half million dollars or something. So if he just signs a one year with somebody, I would expect it to be a better team. And like, who knows if a, if a team throws a ridiculous amount of money at him, maybe he can't say no, but um, I just like, I wouldn't believe in the Knicks if Chris Paul is like their only guy. I don't think that does much for them. Like Chris Paul can only make Wayne Ellington so good. You know, you know what I, I mean? mean, in some ways he was, he was kind of the only guy in OKC. I mean, how, how much do we value Steven Adams? Yeah. You know, and I guess, I mean, Gallinari is, is super underrated. Um, who was it? Somebody was on, on the JJ Reddick pod recently. I, I think it might've been De'Aaron Fox who like was asked, you know, who's one of the most underrated guys that you've had to go up against in the league. And like right away, he's like Gallinari. And I, I thought that was just like such a, you know, usually you kind of get the same recycled answers with those, but like he right away was like, that's the guy who has just always been really tough or, you know, surprisingly better than you would think. Um, so maybe we're uh, underrating that OKC roster a little bit. It's certainly worse than the Knicks, but if you get Chris Paul for 80 games, I think there's a chance. I, the bigger, the bigger issue for me is that I just don't see Chris Paul staying that healthy again. That would be a surprise. Yeah. And they would need him again for all 82. Right. Um, we haven't said much about Charlotte. I know you, you kind of dismiss them and, and I do as well. Usually they're they're I, I think they were better than we thought last year. Certainly winning 23 games in a shortened season. They were they would have had a chance to win 30, which based on where that team was going into the season would have been a, a huge accomplishment. Um, you, know, you get a lot more out of Devontae Graham than expected. I think Terry Rozier became even more efficient. Uh, than, than people expected him to after leaving Boston. But to me, they still feel like they're at least another piece away. And they, they still have like the Batum contract on their books. Like they, I don't know, like there, there's some upward momentum, but it doesn't feel as optimistic as it does in, in some of these other cities like like Chicago and Atlanta. Their cap flexibility is awful because their guys who make a lot of money are, I want to say untradeable because they're expirings, but I have a feeling Batum's going to opt into his $27 million player option. Cody Zeller is guaranteed $15 million. Rozier is on the Why books for Rozier is on the books for $19 million. Um, and I mean, the rest of their, the rest of their core is fine, but like, I mean, obviously Devonte Graham's a standout, right? But Malik Monk, who even knows at this point, like he had a kind of good end of the year. P.J. Washington is interesting. Miles Bridges was a disappointment. We're still kind of waiting for him. The, the Martin brothers were sort of interesting, but I can't tell if that's real or not. Like, because you can't tell when teams, probably not. When, when teams are this bad, like, there are just going to be guys who, like, it's like the Rondé Hollis Jefferson thing. Like, three years ago, we're like, is Rondé Hollis Jefferson, like, a, is actually a good power forward? And it's like, no, he's awful. We just couldn't tell because he's on the nets getting, like, 16 points a game because someone has to. So. Yep. I, I don't have a lot of hope for them at all. I, I will say the Hornets very quietly have the number three pick in the draft. Yeah, everybody's like, yeah. I feel like the only talk you hear about is what is Minnesota doing at one and Golden State has a second overall pick. Like there's been no talk. If it was a different draft, we'd be talking about the Hornets have, you know, basically adding RJ Barrett if this happened last year, you know? Right. So I, I think the uncertainty and a lot of the doubt surrounding this class makes that seem like not that big of a deal, but I don't know. Normally having the number three pick would be, you'd feel pretty good about that. And uh, again, it's different this year, but I don't know. Like, I, I think there's a chance that one of these guys, and I don't even, I don't even want to say who it might be, right? Uh, but somebody in this class is going to be good. You know, I, I think there's a tendency to believe like, this is just a terrible class and, you know, maybe Wiseman turns out, maybe, maybe Edwards turns out, maybe LaMelo turns out, but like, you're going to get, you're going to find some gems somewhere and somebody's going to be this year's Donovan Mitchell. Um, you know, I think ultimately that could kind of swing this for some of these teams because you have, you have Charlotte picking three, you have Chicago four, Cleveland five, Atlanta six, Detroit seven, the Knicks eight, like all these teams are basically picking right in a row, whichever one of those teams maybe like strikes gold on a draft pick, uh, could not only change their fortunes for this year, but I, I think going forward because they're all, you know, save for a couple teams that have some nice young players, they're all kind of in the same spot and, and have been for the last few years. Charlotte would benefit a lot if James Wiseman falls to them. I, that's like the, I want to say a perfect situation because I like, again, you should probably pick the best player available. 
but they already have Rozier and Devontae Graham at guard. Like, I don't know if you want to add another guard to that necessarily. You can, because they're not giving up for it to really matter. But Wiseman would be, would be, I feel like that'd be a good situation for him. It'd be almost no pressure, but he has a point guard in Devontae Graham who's like good enough to run pick and roll with him and stuff like that. Like, he's not going to be, if that was the case, he wouldn't be dropped. Because a lot of times these centers who are pick and roll guys get dropped into situations where their point guard is awful. And just can cannot get them the ball. And Devontae Graham's not like an amazing playmaker, but he's a good passer. And I think he would he would be able to get Wiseman the ball at least. Yeah, I think there's a lot of a lot of interesting potential there. And I think Wiseman's the best fit for for that team. You know, I, I think he, there's kind of been some worry with him, even though he can space the floor. You know, he's not like an extremely great athlete that that you would just say can fit in anywhere. He's not Anthony Davis. He's not Carl Anthony Towns. Um, but Charlotte, I, I think you never want to draft for need in the NBA, almost never, you know, unless you have, uh, Steph Curry at point guard, you probably don't want to take another point guard, but I don't know. They need a center. You like they have, they're paying Cody Zeller 15 million. That's terrible. They've been, they've been playing Bismack by Ambo these last few years. You know, I, I think that would make a lot of sense for them. Uh, especially after it felt like, you know, they, they struck gold on Devonte Graham. Rozier looks like a keeper. Um, and, it, and it feels like they they hit it on the P.J. Washington pick last year as well. I mean, not a guy who's going to be an all-star, but at least seems like they found some pretty good value there. So that they're positioned fairly well. Um, I want to transition to uh, – I don't want to talk about LeBron versus Michael Jordan. I want to start with that. I have no interest <laughs> in debating that. Uh, that one has been beat to death like four separate times now um, over the last few years. Basically, any time LeBron James wins a title. What I would rather talk about is the – kind of the concept of the the top five players in the NBA list, uh, that everyone seems to have their own list. It, it's something that's debated week to week, night to night, during the season, uh, during the playoffs. It's kind of series to series, sometimes even game to game. And at several times over the last few years, um, you know, Le- LeBron has kind of always been the incumbent. But, you know, I, I think when, when Durant won back to back with the Warriors, won both finals MVPs with Steph Curry on his team, I think there were a lot of people who thought at that point, maybe Durant, had captured that title. Uh, I think last year with LeBron not making the playoffs, getting hurt, Kawhi Leonard leading the Raptors on that run. I think there was a lot of Kawhi momentum coming into this season and even going into the playoffs, basically until the Clippers lost. Um, I think it's safe to say right now, LeBron coming off of a, another unanimous finals MVP, that that he's at, he's indisputably number one you know, on that list, at least going into next year. Maybe not for the next three years or the next five years, but right now in time, he's number one. Where does your list, uh, or what is your thought process, I guess, as, as you were, if you compile your mental top five list right now, beyond LeBron at number one, assuming he is there, if not, correct me, um, you know, how do, what, how do we make sense of this with guys like Giannis, Harden, um, you know, Durant not playing last year, Kawhi Leonard, three of the guys who are probably on the list for, for most, uh, most people, you know, kind of going out of the playoffs in embarrassing fashion where, you know, normally you downgrade them, but when two or three other guys in the top five also get eliminated early, it becomes a little bit harder. Well, I have Giannis in there as like a lock. Nog is number one. I have LeBron as number one. But like Giannis was in there as a lock for me. Um, you know, other than that, like, I still think it's fluid. Like, I didn't really know what to do theoretically, theoretically with Durant or Curry just because we haven't seen them. And, you know, I still feel like if it, by the end of next season, we could just accept that they're still top five players, both of those guys. But if you if you count them out because we haven't seen them, then I think it comes down to, to Giannis. Um, I think AD is in there because the more I watch AD, the more I think he's as closer to skill to Giannis as like I – like I, a year, either a year or two ago, like there was a story that came out. I, someone said, you know, AD thinks he's better than Giannis or whatever. And I kind of like laughed that off. And then now it's like, after seeing what he can do in the playoffs, I was like, well, it's probably actually very close. And I know AD is the number two on that team. I mean, he doesn't have to do as much. And could LeBron have done a similar thing if he was LeBron's number two? I don't know. But he has to, I think AD has to be in the top five discussion at this point, right? Like, could he be number five? So, I mean, he's the ultimate example of this going game to game. I think after game one and game two of the finals, it was AD might be number one on the list. You know, that, that I saw that take that he might be the best player in the league. And there are certainly nights when he looks like it. And he looked like it for parts of game six as well. Like 
when Anthony Davis is in that zone of grabbing an offensive rebound, getting his momentum and just like, you know, using his shoulders to just dunk as hard as he can, which he really didn't do a whole lot early in his career. Like when he's in that mindset, I think he's up there with, with Giannis and LeBron and Harden and Curry, Durant, whoever, like he's, he's in that, he's in that category. I think the problem with him is that to, to some level, we saw him have the opportunity to lead his own team. And I, I still don't think, you know, even though that was the, the start of his career, you know, a lot of those years he was really young and, and you know, frankly, pretty frail and what really wasn't the player that he is now. I, I would say overall, he failed to be the number one guy. You know, they, they won one playoff series in that time. It was a super tough Western Conference, not a great roster, all the caveats. But I think there's a, there's a belief and there's mostly proof that guys like Giannis, Harden, uh, you know, Lillard, Jokic, Durant, Kawhi, Curry, all those guys can be the number one guy on a very, very good team. Not not a team that's going to be frisky and maybe up, make an upset in the first round, like a team that has a chance to go to the conference finals every year. And, you know, at some point we'll probably see that with Davis, whether it's with the Lakers when LeBron declines or with another team in the future. But I, I think the thing holding me back is like, he's an, it, he's an incredible number two. He's way overqualified for that, but we still haven't seen him, you know, carry a team to like 55 wins as the number one option. Yeah, and I'm looking uh, right now at his uh, Anthony Davis is the his the team the guys he's played the most with, and the top three guys he's played the most games with are Drew Holiday, who's very good, uh, good. Dante Dante Cunningham and Darius Miller. So <laughs> even so, <laughs> that is a great stat. Wow. So even though yes, we did see Anthony Davis play by himself or as the number one guy, it was pretty bad. I like that rivals LeBron's like some of LeBron's teammates who his top three teammates are Ilgauskas, Verjao, and James Jones in terms of games played. Um, that's not minutes because this doesn't have minutes on there, but, like, that's, yeah. I mean, Drew like, Holiday is better than anybody LeBron played with oh, to start his career, but still, Dante Cunningham. I know. Not even in the I, league. I, yeah, and then after after Darius Miller, it's Etwan Moore, Ryan Anderson, Eric Gordon, Alexis Aginsa, Tyreek Evans, Omer Ashik. Like, it's horrible. So... I don't know if we're legally allowed to talk about Alexis Sajinsa on this podcast. <laughs> it's yeah, that's first bad. Video, bad. Yeah, first video podcast, and we're getting into the Ajinsa talk. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. I think if you built a team around AD, it would be better, right? Like the, what he was given was awful, and this is like a thing where you know LeBron went to Miami, he had a team built around him, and then went back to a team that had flexibility. Um, and had bigger talent. Like if, you know, if the Pelicans got another good free, like if Anthony Davis went back to the Pelicans right now and had like Zion, Ingram, Andrew Holiday with them, like, you know, they could be a really good team. But um, so I don't know. It, it, you're, you're right. Like AD is someone tough to rank where he fluctuates a lot, but I think you could put him at number five. And because I, I don't know. Yeah. I Yeah. I think it's fair. And I don't know that there's a correct list right now. I, I would put together my own list and I would not I would not look you in the eye and be like, this is right, whatever you have is wrong. I mean, if you let's say you want to put AD on your list in, in no order, let's say it's LeBron, Giannis, Anthony Davis, Kawhi Leonard, and you know, Luka Doncic. That that's no Kevin Durant, no Steph Curry, no Damian Lillard, no James Harden, no Nikola Jokic, who looked like maybe the best player in the league at times in the playoffs. Like yeah. I don't think it's a slight to not be in the top five. Um, it, it's just, it's unbelievably deep. And I, I don't know that the league has been this deep, even in the last few years. Like all these guys have been in their primes, you know, for the last two or three seasons. But I think the addition of Doncic becoming this good right away it throws a wrench into it because you can't say anybody's wrong for having him in their top five. And then you throw in Jimmy Butler, you know, all of a sudden, right. I, I think for a lot of people, it's going to become a hot take to throw him, maybe not in your top five, but he probably belongs in the top 10. So it's, I don't know. I, at the end of the day, there's, there's no, there's no wrong answer, but I think it'll be interesting to see how, whether we're talking fantasy or people on first take or, you know, the SI and the ESPN list that come out each year, like, you know, how does this losing in the playoffs this year, how does that affect Harden? How does it affect Giannis? How does it affect Kawhi? Um, because I think for the first time, especially with Giannis and Kawhi, this is like the first time that they've ever really faced true doubt. You know, where I think Kawhi's, you know, kind of went from being this quiet role player to a star. And, you know, he, he got hurt one year and basically has just won every everywhere he's been since until this season. And 
you know, Giannis is coming off of a second straight MVP, but I think he's going to face criticism next year that he will have never faced uh, in the past. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I mean, the league is insanely deep. Like, I think if you tried to set out to make, like, even if you tried to make the most controversial top five possible with kind of the names we have outlined, so assuming you still went LeBron and Giannis, because I feel like that's almost a lock, like Giannis at number two, I feel like that if you put him lower than that, you're maybe Kawhi could be at number two. But, you know, any like you can't even, you know, it would be like Jimmy Butler at number three would probably be like the most controversial. But at this point, like what, after what people saw, that's something that would probably age badly in like two years, not like, you know, right now if someone saw that list. And right. having like Jokic over Kawhi or something might do it. But like you have, I mean, you could even have Doncic over Harden. And it's like, I couldn't even really, because personally, like what I saw from Doncic in the playoffs was just as good as anything Harden has ever done in the playoffs. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. And I, I think the thing with Jokic is like defensively, there's still some limitations. So like, I, I would still lean Kawhi as my number two. I, I don't, I don't think he's, as much to blame as you know obviously he had a bad game seven but i think there were some other things going on you know with that team that that affected how they finished um the biggest thing too is going to be how, how does durant come back because you would have it was insane to ever put durant i think lower than three at any point over the last basically decade with the exception of last season and if he comes back as that guy again I mean, I think Durant versus Kawhi almost becomes more interesting than LeBron versus Kawhi or LeBron versus KD. Because I, I think those guys are a little bit closer. Like LeBron, LeBron's just on a different level than those guys. LeBron's in the same category as like two other guys ever. And and Durant and Kawhi are, are in the same category as like 15 other guys ever. They're they're still great. But I think Durant versus healthy Durant versus healthy Kawhi is, is a really fun debate. I would I would rather have healthy Durant. Me too. That's just me. But yeah, I mean, there's a there's a possibility. Like, if he if he does come back, because he, I mean, the layoff for him between his Achilles injury and when we're actually going to play competitive basketball again, which could be like March, mm-hmm. is going to be such a long layoff that he could be like up. He could be 100 percent healthy, and then if he's 100 percent healthy, he could be the second best player in the league again. Like, that's not crazy. Um, and he's still a good defender. Like, he's not like a negative on defense, kind of like Curry. Not that he's like a complete negative, but he's not a two-way player. Jokic's not a two-way player. Lillard's not a two-way player. Mm. Doncic and Hargan aren't really two-way players. So if you value that, then it's like Durant, Kawhi, Giannis should all be up there. And so should AD. Yeah. I, I, it'll be interesting, I think, to see how much that impacts Doncic going forward. Because you know, even if you're thinking the most optimistic way possible, like Luka Doncic is never going to be an all NBA defender. He's never going to be a guy who, you know, finishes with any votes in, you know, defensive player of the year. Like pretty much all those guys that you just mentioned have at some point in their career. Some of them are, are in that position right now. You know, I, I, I just don't know. Like we, you can only, you can only go so high in the all time rankings, I guess, when you're an average defender. And we're kind of seeing that with Curry, like you said. Yeah. It's, it's, it's tough to rank that high when you, when you're not a two way player, which mm-hmm. just is. All right, so let's finish out. Uh, you and I put together a, a very early top 250 uh, for, for one of our affiliates, NFBKC. If you're listening to this, there's a good chance you've played in, in some of their contests before. Uh, but they basically asked us to just kind of put together a list for their reference as they put together their their rankings and their projections looking ahead to next season. So I mean, with the caveat that you know we did not you know go through the normal tedious process that we would when we put out our, our real rankings that'll come before next season, um, you know, th- this was just more of a, a fun exercise for us in a lot of ways to to go through and, and project out uh, next season. Who are some players that, you know, as you and I went back and forth uh, over Skype and over Slack last week when we put this together, who, you know, you either disagreed with where I wanted to put them or you felt like you wanted to put them higher, but there was something holding you back. Maybe you wanted to put them a little bit lower, but you knew um, that there's kind of a hype factor. I, I think Zion Williamson was one guy who we... I think we're both a little bit lower on than the general public, but you just know that, that he's going to be overdrafted. Um, are, are there any other players that, that fit any of those categories for you? Uh, two guys kind of lower on the list, but kind of in that second and third round range were John Collins and Brandon Ingram. I had a really hard time with John Collins because the addition of Capella, I don't know what that's going to do with his rebounding numbers, to his shot blocking numbers. Is he as good from three as we think he might be? 
Um, and then Ingram, we saw Ingram kind of take a step back once Zion started playing again. Uh, and a lot of that does come down to team context as well. If they ship off Drew Holiday, if they get rid of like Lonzo Ball and Ingram just becomes like a way more high usage player, I'm sure he can be where he was this season. But if if they keep the same team, I don't know, because Zion could end up with the ball a lot more. He's kind of his own offense within the offense. Um, and he was just he was just tough to rank for me. Yeah, I, I think those are both fair. Um, I mean, at the top, we, we went Harden, Davis, Towns, Lillard, Giannis as our top five. Uh, and, and we discussed this about a month ago in an article when we, we put out a kind of a, a tiering, I guess, for, um, you know, how, how we evaluate the first round for next year. And for Giannis, it just comes down to the free throws. You know, if he was yeah. a if he was a marginally better free throw shooter, he would pretty much be it would, it, him and Harden are kind of on an island for the number one guys, given that, um, you know, that caveat. But I don't know how much I re- would really trust for that to dramatically improve next year. It, it's kind of gone the other way the last couple of years. Yeah. And his defensive stats weren't crazy either. Like he won defensive player of the year, but he was averaging like just, I think, a little over two combined blocks and steals. So like the path for him to be a legitimate top five pick in fantasy is going to be improving his field goal percentage by like somewhere between five and 10 percent, which is, I mean, possible. And then maybe getting like an extra half steal and block combined that will really shoot him up there. Because this season, I think I think he finished 13th per game. And obviously, like if that's someone you're drafting top five, that's like pretty bad value. (laughs) So and Harden, you know, Harden's a guy who we may not even have in our personal top fives of like NBA players that we'd want in the playoff series or whatever. But his fantasy resume or what he, how far the gap is between him as the number one guy and like AD as the number two guy is, I think the biggest single spot gap in the NBA. He's just, he's just dominant. So I, I confidently pick him number one. Yeah, that's a really good point to make. I, I think given the the situation with Giannis's free throw percentage, I, I think Harden Harden not only is dominant as a three point shooter, dominant beyond dominant at the free throw line. I think that's the biggest thing. Is like the if he if he's healthy, which he always is, that's the other thing. He's he's dominant from a health perspective. He's a lock to lead the league in free throws and hit them at a high rate. Yeah, you know, with with Curry back, maybe there's now some competition for for the three point title. But even when Curry was at his best. Harden's volume was higher. Like, I mean, part of it is the system that he plays in. He didn't have Kevin Durant and Clay Thompson around him. But, um, I mean, he's, I, I think he's, like you said, he's the number one player who has, and despite being, by some measures, a top three, top five player in the league, his, the gap between his fantasy value and real life value is still cavernous. Yeah, because he's, it's, he's all offense. Right. And exactly. in fantasy, that's still the vast majority of where you're, yeah, yeah look, it comes from. And he still gets defensive stats. You know, like as he much does, as we yeah. criticize his defense, like he is all offense, but he also gets a ton of steals. I think he led, didn't he lead the league in steals? He might, he might have. I, I think he did. And he blocked, I think he blocked a shot a game this year. Uh, I mean, he, I, I, like he's, he's just the perfect fantasy player. You know, okay, he didn't lead yeah. the league in steals, but he was at 2.0 last year and then 1.8 this year uh, and was at 0.9 blocks. That was a career high. So he really doesn't kill you in any area whatsoever. Um, we have Jason Tatum at 14. I I think that's about right. Uh, it seems like he's going to continue ascending. He picked up where he left off in the bubble. Uh, but with him, it kind of gets to the point where you start to look at the guys above him and you, it's just really tough to rank him above any of those names who are essentially just perennial all NBA players. Yeah. I think the big question is going to be, do you draft him or Durant if you're, if they're both on the, if they're both on the board still. I think that's going to be a really tough call because statistically they have a similar profile, right? But Durant should yeah. be better, but you never know about injuries still. Um, it, that's a tough choice. Like I don't, I don't, and I will not enjoy making that choice if I have to. I am fully prepared to live and die by Kevin Durant this year. Okay. I'm, I'm expecting him to be available at a discount in drafts and in, in auction formats because of the reasons that you just stated. I'm all in. I, I don't know. I, I think the time off, I, I think the fact that, you know, he's not that old. Um, he's not somebody who's, you know, like DeMarcus Cousins, who weighs like 280 pounds and is putting a ton of pressure on that. Like, I just think this is going to go pretty well. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being optimistic. But I, I think for the discount that you're going to get on Duran, I, I just don't see them resting him like 15 games next year. I, I don't think right. it'll really be necessary. 
Yeah, I can see that. I think I think maybe in early drafts he'll start off at a discount, but then I think people are just gonna keep talking themselves into yeah. that, and then he'll end up being like the eighth guy in most drafts right. by the time like it's really in the swing of things. And we keep talking about the depth in the league. This also translates to fantasy, where you could get yeah. you know you could get like Jimmy Butler at the end of the second round, or you can get Bam Adebayo to begin the third round. You know, like it, it's it's gonna be a really fun year, I think, to play fantasy where. You don't feel like if you're not picking in the top six, all of a sudden you're at this huge disadvantage because you don't have one of these like major superstars. Like it would not be surprising at all if Jason Tatum finishes the year as a top eight fantasy player. Right. And there are some guys who could easily make a leap from like 60 into, you know, higher range. Like who even knows what's going to happen with Draymond Green, for example? Yeah. Like could, if you draft him 50th, could he end up being like the twentieth guy again? Like, does he have that in him? I don't he know. Could end up being the one hundred twentieth guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you what he's not going to finish fiftieth. No, he's either going to go really well or really poorly with him. Yeah, boom or bust. But I, I mean, Red Van Fleet is one of those guys too, where we've seen him in in kind of this semi muted role where he's been really good. If he goes and signs with the Knicks or whoever, you know, some team where it's like it's your show now, you know that. He's somebody that could that could dramatically make a leap. Yeah, we might be able to get, you know, some of these like second year guys are hard to project and it is hard to make rankings without doing some projections. But Tyler Hero, like you'd probably get him seventh. You know, if you're if you're someone who plays risky, like you might. I, I don't know what Blake Griffin's stock is at this point because his the variance on him is crazy. Mm-hmm. But you could still maybe draft him like sixth or seventh round and that could end up paying off. Like if he plays 70 games. Um, right. you still have guys like guys like Bertans, who knows where he's going to end up. Um, it's just for, deep. Yeah, for me, Kyle Lowry is kind of the the anti Durant for me. Like I'm I'm 100 in on Durant. I'm I'm pretty high on John Wall too. I think I'll be targeting him. I I'm, I'm banking on this being finally the year that Kyle Lowry drops off. If if I thought it was going to be this past year, I'm now <laughs> pushing that prediction to 2021. It just I don't know. It, it seems like that run is over. You know, I, I think. I think he's been so solid for them. They've been running him so hard for seven years now. It, it, I don't know. I, I, I'm just expecting him to either break down physically or, or kind of start to hit that veteran wall. That wouldn't be surprising. Like we saw, we've seen that happen before where all of a sudden it's just over. Like Marc Gasol, like it was just over this year. It was he's bad. Not a viable fantasy player. And now we might play in Europe. Like yeah. it's, it's it happens pretty quick. I think I think he knew it was over too. Well, right? yeah, he, he was did. very self aware of of his overness. Uh, are are we in agreement that Clay Thompson is just going to come back and be the same Clay Thompson? Yeah, I think so. I haven't heard I, one person even talk about his injury. It's just assumed that he's going to be fine, and I I think he will be. <laughs> I think so too. I think you can draft him where he's been drafted, which is like third round, right? And that's just fine. Yeah, mid to late thirties. I think that's yeah. I don't see any reason why that would change, honestly. Um. Yeah, I'm trying to scroll through this list and see if anybody jumps out. I mean, I know we talked about Jaron Jackson and like the want to put him higher. And then you look and you check his game logs and he has like three games in a row where he has nine total rebounds. Yeah, his uh, his rebounding is a is a really an issue where because he hits threes and he blocks shots and he's scoring like almost 20 a game. But like if he if he does that, but he's only grabbing five rebounds a game, he's he's like he's basically just like a, he puts up the same numbers as like a small forward. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what to do with him, especially if Valanciunas is still there because Valanciunas just grabs every available rebound on the court. So if they, if they move off of Valanciunas, I'm going to feel a lot better about Jaron Jackson from a rebounding perspective and just overall. And same with Brandon Clark. Like if they find a way to do a Jaron Jackson, Brandon Clark starting front court, both those guys get like a huge boost. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. All right. We have about, 45 seconds left. Give me your very quick pitch on what to make of TJ Warren. Uh, I think he'll be a little bit better. A lot of it depends on if Oladipo and Miles Turner will still be there. If they are both gone and he's like the second scoring option, I'd draft him, <laughs> draft him in the fifth round. I don't know, fourth round? We put him at 65. I, I felt like that was conservative. Uh, for now, yeah. He's someone who will probably get moved up rather than moved down. Right. Right. All right. Um, we'll at some point make these rankings public. We'll tweak them, continue to do so as we get to the draft and free agency. Uh, but Alex, we're running out of time. Uh, make sure to catch us on Dash Radio's NBA channel. You can look at our uh, all of our content on rotowire.com. You can find our podcast feed there as well. 
We will be back next week.